Well, let's get to our panel right now. There's much to discuss about the Trump administration. Let's bring in the panel here in the studio is Sonia Dridi. She's a Washington correspondent for France 24 and Europe One. Also with us is Afshin Malavi. He's a senior fellow with the Foreign Policy Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. From Dallas, we're joined by Merrill Matthews. He's a resident scholar at the Institute for Policy Innovation, a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy think tank. And Brian Becker is the executive director for the Answer Coalition and a commentator on USDPRK relations. Thanks to all of you for being with us. Afshin, let me start with you. Shinzo Abe and Donald Trump, they have a good relationship. It's a relatively close relationship. Um, as one report said today, there's been no other foreign leader that has spoken to Trump more than Shinzo Abe. So how important is this meeting? I think it's very important, particularly for Shinzo Abe. I mean, Shinzo Abe is mired in a corruption scandal at home. His poll numbers are plummeting. Um, and one of the things that he, you know, um, he bet on was this relationship with President Donald Trump. And what has he really gotten out of it? Uh, you know, President Donald Trump seems to have exempted everyone. I mean, I joke a little bit, uh, except for Japan on the steel and aluminum tariffs. Uh, and also, um, you know, on North Korea, um, Shinzo Abe is very uncomfortable uh, with this pending meeting between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. So he's going to have to show that he can get something out of this Mar-a-Lago summit. He was blindsided by that, wasn't he? Yeah, he really was blindsided, absolutely. Right. Sonia, uh what, uh, this, this meeting, that I mean, it's taking place at a time when the United States has just reversed its position on uh, joining the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's also taking place at a time when there's heated rhetoric between China and the United States over trade and tariffs right now. Um, what is your reporting on what will come out of this meeting? Um, I think that it's for Shinzo Abe, I think it's, a, it's just very practical. Um, we will talk later about the French president, but I think as the French pre president is very practical toward his relation with um, President Trump. He wants to be, you know, more have more visibility on the international uh, stage, especially with what's going on between uh, the U.S. and uh, North Korea. So, so I think for uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, this um, relationship with uh, President Trump is very important. I heard that from many, um, you know, specialists who work on on uh, Japan, that he has a personal uh, relationship that is pretty good with uh, President Trump. So, um, yeah, I think it's, 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 uh, it's very practical and it's, uh, it's very, very important, especially because of the, the, the issue with North Korea. All right, let me bring uh, Merrill into this conversation. And Merrill, how different uh, is, will this meeting be for these two leaders uh, compared to the previous ones. I mean, a lot has happened. The United States, uh, according to media reports here, say that Abe was not uh, given advance notice of this meeting that is uh, supposed to be taking place between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, the DPRK leader. And as uh, Afshin just pointed out, um, there was also Trump's decision to not to exempt uh, China, uh, Japan rather, um, from these new tariffs on steel and aluminium. So do you think this has strained the relationship in some way? Uh, it probably has. Uh, in fairness to uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe, uh, Donald Trump blindsides a lot of people, including sometimes his closest advisors, uh, with his actions. So, uh, you know, it's interesting because Japan had gone a long way in the uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership in lowering some of its tariffs on a number of areas, especially rice and so forth. So they had really taken some major steps for the U.S. to drop out of that was, I think, a real blow to Japan. And now President Trump apparently wants to uh, consider re-entering that. Uh, at least that's the, the message that he has given. And then he also likes to do by, part, by uh, uh, bi level uh, negotiations on trade. And I, because he feels like the U.S. being the largest economy in the world can extract even bigger uh, concessions from various groups. So we'll just have to see what comes from them, this, but it's a, a something of an unknown factor given all that Donald Trump has done recently. Brian, the DPRK's nuclear program, that's going to be a top priority during this meeting. Now, we know that Shinzo Abe, the Japanese leader, is a hardliner on the DPRK. What do you expect he will be telling Donald Trump? Well, he is a hardliner, but he's also here at Mar-a-Lago something as a supplicant. Uh, he needs Donald Trump much more than Donald Trump needs Shinzo Abe. End of the day, if Shinzo Abe isn't reelected, there will be another Japanese prime minister, and that person will make relations with the United States a top priority based on the nature of the relationship. 
So yes, Abe is in a bind right now uh, in many ways. He has really wanted to militarize Japan in a dramatic, profound, dynamic way. He wants to get rid of the pacifist part of the Constitution. If, in fact, there's no uh, change in terms of the DPRK position on intercontinental ballistic missile or, as you mentioned earlier, mid-range and short-range missiles, and, of course, it's developed successfully a hydrogen bomb, if anything, I think Shinzo Abe and his base, the more right-wing militarist nationalist base in Japan, will use that as an argument for why they should go ahead, uh, not only getting rid of Article 9 of the Constitution, but perhaps even starting to move in the direction of having Japan be an independent nuclear power. Donald Trump, again, we never know what he's going to say, but when he came into office, he said, well, yeah, maybe uh, South Korea and Japan should get nuclear weapons, too. Uh, in some ways, that would be music to the ear of Shinzo Abe. But from the point of view of the DPRK, uh, the DPRK, looking at what they just saw, what happened in Syria over the weekend, uh, that doesn't in induce them to say, yeah, let's get rid of our missile technology, right. if anything, just the opposite. One other thing, Brian, and that is uh, we've been getting reports out of South Korea that the DPRK and the ROK, otherwise known as North and South Korea, uh, are looking to officially end the war. This is very big. Right. It's going to be on April 27th. Yeah. Uh, the, they're going to meet together. Of course, since June 25th, 1950, they've been technically and in all ways at war, June 25th, 1950. Uh, Donald Trump sort of oddly, an odd choice of words, said he gave his blessings to it. I'm, I'm sure North Korea didn't require his blessings, so I guess he's giving the go-ahead to South Korea, sort of showing, again, that South Korea has limited sovereignty and needs someone's blessings to talk to other Koreans. But nonetheless, uh, this is big, this is historic, and the yeah. fact that Trump did say he's giving it his blessings also means, in fact, that the U.S. is not trying to obstruct this, uh, this meeting from happening. This almost happened in June 2000 at the historic summit between Kim Dae-jung and Kim Jong-il, who was Kim Jong-un's father. Right. Uh, this could, I think this is big. This is a game changer in the, in the case of Korea. And of course, it needs to happen as a precursor to the early June meeting between Trump and Kim Jong-un. Right. Sonia, yeah, let's know, move. And, Sorry, go ahead, uh, Merrill. I, I was just going to say, historically, American presidents have just simply rejected the notion of meeting with Kim because they didn't want to raise that level of you're on the same level as the American president. Who knows what Donald Trump is thinking on this, but it may be that he feels like if he can just do this, uh, Kim will feel satisfied he's been accepted in the international community and may feel the ability to be able to go into an agreement with uh, South Korea. I, it's hard to know, but he, uh, Donald Trump is certainly breaking the mold in this meeting. So now I want to move on to the other big international story that's been making headlines over the past few days. That is the strike on Syria by the United States, together with its European allies, the United Kingdom and France, uh, because they suspected that the Syrian government used chemical weapons in Douma near uh, Damascus. Now, the French president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, has been defending France's participation in this strike. He did it over the weekend. He did it again today. Let's listen to part of what he had to say. On numerous occasions, several members of the international community have taken steps to lessen the power of the UN and the OPCW. Since November 2017, by deconstructing the OPCW's allocation mechanism and then by opposing all resolutions allowing further measures to be taken. These same members, who are outraged by the images that we have seen of children and women killed by chlorine attacks, the same. Do we remain seated? Do we defend rights by saying rights are for us, principles are for us, but the reality is for others? No, no. No. So we had President Macron there talking before the European Parliament. He's also been criticized for not consulting the French legislature before the attack. Uh, Will this action hurt him? What is French public opinion like? Yeah, it's very divided in France, actually. Yeah. Um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of people s support this action because, you know, since 2013, when Francois Hollande was ready to uh, intervene in Syria, and then because Obama didn't, Barack Obama didn't act, uh, France stopped. But it's been for a while um, the the the. The public opinion in France is very sensitive to what's going on in Syria, the fact that there has been a chemical art, uh, attack. But um, a part of the population also feel that Emmanuel Macron is maybe a bit drawn to go to war because of Donald Trump and that he wants, you know, it's, 
Sarkozy had Libya, Nicolas Sarkozy, and now Emmanuel Macron wants to to have Syria, and, and you know, uh, right. not even a year after being elected, he, he wants his war. That's what a lot of people also see in the U.S., and, and they, they feel that uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron has a pretty good relationship with Donald Trump. He's coming here in a, in a few days. He's also very practical. Mm -hmm. he, he needs this relation with the U.S., and some people in France are also um, pleased that now, you know, Trump will look at uh, France before Germany, that used to be, you know, the, the most uh, important yeah. partner uh, for the U.S. So the, the, the opinion is very divided, especially because uh, Emmanuel Macron didn't consult the parliament. So it's, it's definitely going to hurt him in a way, but we have to see what's, what's next. And as in America, some people feel like Emmanuel Macron doesn't have a a broader strategy in Syria. Now it's after the, the strikes that was punctual, uh, maybe one time shot like uh, Jim Mattis say for the US. Yeah. He says now it's the UN will have to take care of the issues. So some people feel also it was maybe more like a, um, for his you know image that he had to intervene because he said there is a red line, but the, 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 the strike were, may, was, were maybe more symbolic uh, mm -hmm. and now is putting back the issues and, uh, for the UN to, to deal with. So um, it's, it's definitely going to hurt him uh, in some way, but we have to see what's, what's going to be next for, for Syria and the, the politics from France in Syria. All right, Meryl, uh, there's been, of course, a lot of spin after this attack here in the United States and what it achieved. We had President Trump talking about mission accomplished. Uh, what exactly did this accomplish, this attack? It, well, it's not entirely clear, but it did a couple of things, I guess. Number one, the, the reports are that uh, uh, the advisors encouraged President Trump to go much more restricted than he actually wanted to do. He apparently followed that advice, and it worked out very well because this was perceived as a targeted attack uh, that was limited and meant to punish Syria but not to overthrow the regime. And that's gotten widespread praise in the U.S., both from Republicans and Democrats. And then, of course, that's going to be followed up by uh, Macron coming to the U.S. on April 25th to give a, uh, a speech to a joint session of Congress. When Nicolas Sarkozy did that a few years back, it was widely, it was very well received in the U.S. and really cemented some relationships because of the, way, of the nature of the speech. And I think Macron's going to do that as well. Brian, here we had an action taken by the United States and its allies. This was an act of war conducted not on the basis of facts, but on the basis of what they believed, mm. of an allegation, uh, of an unverified claim that Syria had conducted this chemical weapons attack. I mean, what do you make of that? Is that the new normal now? You just have to believe something and carry out an attack rather than find incontrovertible proof that, something, that someone did violate international Even law? Even threatening the another member nation with the use of force without an accepting the condition of imminent self-defense is a violation of the UN Charter. This is an illegal act. It's a violation of international and also U.S. law because the U.S. is a signatory to the U.N. Charter and thus it's the highest law of the land. The United States government does not have the right, Britain does not have the right, France does not have the right to decide to militarily strike another country. Again, in this case, without uh, incontrovertible proof or any proof. But even if uh, Assad's government or forces aligned with it had used chemical weapons, uh, only the UN Security Council would give a member nation of the United Nations uh, legal authorization to go ahead and use force. Right. That was achieved in the case of Libya through res Resolution 1973, I think misused because it was carried out for regime change. This was illegal. This was unethical, immoral, illegal. Let me get Merrill to you on this. You know, this. You, can't go through yeah. this, you, you can't go through the Security Council on this because Russia would veto it. So it, it's, uh, it's not to defend it necessarily, so, but it was targeted and limited, and that's generally gotten a lot of support for well, it. Well, can other countries, no. can other countries but, bomb the United States? Can other countries say, well, we can't get it through the UN Security Council, so we'll take independent unilateral action? No, and, it's not legal. And, and on, okay, we, yeah. we, we have... Um, you know, we've seen Syria use chemical weapons in the past. I right. mean, this is not, I mean, we, there's been many chemical attacks uh, that have been used. And, and, and you know, and, and, and just because, you know, uh, we, we may have to go through the UN Security Council, at the end of the day, I mean, there are children, you know, being killed. Right. There's, you know, civilians being killed. Russia and Iran have intervened, you know, I here. I have to uh, disagree with you because how can, 
First of all, why would the you Assad... disagree that civilians why, are being I'm, killed? I'm, I'm, I'm that chemical I'm dis, weapons I'm, are being I'm, used? Yes, I'm disagreeing. Wow. I'm, I'm disagreeing. You're on the record I, saying I, that I'm dis, you don't think the Assad regime has I'm been gonna, using I'm chemical weapons. I'm going to try to finish my comment, which is wow. I'm disagreeing okay. with your assertion without proof that the Assad government uh, used chemical weapons in Douma. It was on the verge of victory. It had already reached an agreement with the armed factions to leave and to go to Idlib. Why would the Assad government use the one military weapon that would trigger a foreign intervention? Why? It doesn't make any logical sense. But if you think, in spite of the fact that it doesn't make sense that they did it, let's have proof. You can't be the proof. Sure. Your well, assertion cannot be the well, proof. Uh, yeah. Afshin, what about the point that the inspectors, the chemical weapons inspectors, only went in today, Wednesday? Right. Mm -hmm. Should not other world powers have waited for those inspectors to have reported on whatever they find there? Well, it, I mean, they're, they're really not given the access that they yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Russian forces went in earlier. Um, there have been reports that there were cleanup operations. Look, at the end of the day, I mean, this is a, uh, a leader that has been, you know, a barrel bombing his own people. I mean, you know, this is, I don't, I don't understand why we need to give him the benefit of the doubt. Uh, at the end, there are children, you know, dying, you know, being killed before our eyes. So, so I think that um, it, is, it is complicated. It yeah. certainly is complicated. But I think that just to automatically give him the benefit of the doubt is wrong as well. And I would yeah. add that you have local journalists mm -hmm. on the ground. You have uh, intelligence report. So even in France, I think very few people thought that you had chemical attacks. That's, you know, a right, fact. Right. Uh, people are more bothered about the, 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 the result of the strike. Either yeah. you strike only when you have chemical attacks, and why, why don't you act when, you know, people are getting killed by bombs, but, Russia or, yeah. or, or, or Syria, and, uh, and the other part would just don't want to intervene at all. But the fact that there was a chemical attacks, um, chemical attacks in France, it's, it's, it's mainly accepted. But are accepted. there questions being raised in France uh, over the fact that this attack was carried out without there being any proof? Sorry? Was there, are there questions being raised in France that the fact mm -hmm. that France entered into this attack? Very few. Yeah. Uh, the, the debate is more about do we have to intervene or do we yeah. have to intervene okay. more or do we don't uh, or we should not intervene because it's too late. We should have right. intervened maybe uh, before. But very few people dubbed the fact that there were chemical attacks uh, and and okay. because but, of. But again, you. We're giving, you are giving the benefit of the doubt to those who are without UN Security Council resolutions authorizing the, the missile strikes on a sovereign country. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, once you say some countries have this right to carry out missile strikes, and it will always be with a noble cause to protect civilians, mm -hmm. and without proof, uh, we set a dangerous precedent. There goes the rule of law yeah. internationally. Well, it, it's Go also ahead. worth noting here, Anand, mm -hmm. that that, I mean, I'd rather be on, on, on this side of history than on Assad's side of right. history. Mm -hmm. But it's worth noting that it hasn't changed much geopolitically on right. the ground. Right. I mean, you know, the Russian forces and Iranian forces are still there, mm -hmm. and men on the ground defeat airstrikes from afar all the time. Right. I want to move on to another topic right now, and that is this very ugly spat that we're seeing between President Trump and the former director of the FBI, James Comey. Some would say it's very juvenile. We've heard that as well. Merrill, uh, Hearing what these both men are calling each other, calling each other liars, President Trump calling James Comey a slime ball, James Comey saying that President Trump is morally unfit for this office. Have both men actually done serious damage to their respective offices? <laughs> I, th I think so. Uh, President Trump tends to do that on a regular basis. Um, uh, James Comey has done this in, in, with his response, and my understanding is a number of FBI agents are upset with what he's done in the book because it looks a bit too self-serving. And so we'll see what happens from this, uh, but James Comey is out promoting a book. Uh, he may be, he's, he's very sympathetic in his presentation. He comes across very rational, but there's a lot of people who step up and say, but he's wrong about this. Yeah. He's actually said this and it wasn't true. So it's a, it's a war of words right now. It's more theater than it is anything substantive, but it's, it's, Interesting to watch. Sonia, in a sense, this is a very domestic issue. You know, as Merrill pointed out, James Comey is going to be published. Well, the book is out already. Uh, he's going to be going on a book tour. How much interest is there in a country like France over this story? There is a lot of interest yeah. because it's still pretty extraordinary that you have this, uh, we'll see in France, uh, combat cock, like this fight between the president and the former yeah. FBI director. Um, James Comey has been interviewed today on the first news channel in France, BFM TV, which is very national news. 
Um, so it shows that if a channel like that, you know, has an interview with James Comey, there is a lot of interest in France. And people talk a lot about it. I mean, on social media, a lot of uh, French people commenting, a lot of them, you know, kind of laughing at what's going on because it's, it's uh, having that, that much insult between two, two people like that is pretty uh, extraordinary. But people have been following the, the, the stories, you know, since Flynn has been uh, right. uh, dismissed. So they, a lot of people are, are pretty interesting in what James Comey has to say, and a lot of people believe what James Comey has to say in France. Um, but there is also this, this feeling that it's also kind of a revenge from the ex-FBI well, that, that, director. That is true. There's never a dull moment here in Washington. Uh, Brian, what do you make of the fact that you know, this story and others, of course, have thrown up really, some really strange alliances and allegiances, if I could put it that way? I mean, if you look at James Comey, former director of the FBI, which was severely criticized by liberals and progressives in the past for a lot of its policies, its civil rights policies, etc. Now he's being cast as the hero. Yeah, he's embraced. He's the great hero. I mean, yeah. it's, it's an amazing turnaround in American politics. You have the Democratic Party, including liberals, people right. who consider themselves progressive, sounding in the context of this campaign because of their animus, and I think rightfully so, towards Donald Trump, to embrace not only uh, James Comey, but Robert Mueller, who we were all protesting as Robert Mueller rounding up South Asians and yeah. Muslims and Arab people without uh, due process or due cause and putting them in solitary confinement. Right. Now liberals are embracing him. And at the same time, I think the, the liberal and the Democratic Party are sounding a lot like the Republicans during Ronald Reagan beating the, the drums of war against Russia in such a way that it's dangerous. Uh, and, and here we have a situation where James Comey, I agree with Merrill, I mean, James Comey and Trump are going at, it, at each other for their own narrow personal yeah. reasons. Uh, it's quite something, but ultimately, ultimately, it's got a political message here. Right. Ufshin, what's and, your and take? Let me just add that there's, okay. Very quickly, there's this other aspect to it, which is the salaciousness of this. It's right. not just the FBI and the president. You've got, this, you've got porn stars. You've got Playboy yeah. people. You've got all kinds of people we have it all. swirling well, around welcome, on this. Welcome to the new Washington, right? Uh, I guess that's it. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, Mer you know, Merrill said this is theater, um, and we're living in this theater, it feels like, uh, every day, and we have uh, a whiplash. Right. There were some reports, and no less from the New York Times today, which is no friend of Donald mm -hmm. Trump, that Comey may have hurt this very carefully cultivated image, as the New York Times puts it. Yeah, you know, he may have. I mean, and look, at the end of the day, I mean, the book was leaked. I mean, yeah, there's, there's so much leaking going on in Washington that we should be flooded by now. Um, uh, but, but, you know, there's just a lot of leaks coming out of both the Mueller investigation, uh, the, the Comey book. Uh, and and, and it, look, Donald Trump's ratings are still around 50, 51 percent. Uh, and, and maybe that's what he should talk about with Shinzo Abe, because they're both embroiled in scandals, and Abe's you know, uh, ratings are plummeting, and right. Donald Trump's are staying roughly around 50, 51 percent. Okay, we are going to have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That is it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for being with us.